Welcome to the Word of a King podcast. It's where culture clashes with our calling, where preaching is more important than popularity, where we rightly divide and properly apply the scriptures, where we put to rest common and controversial issues. We do this by looking to the Word of a King. The key to understand the Word of God is for the author to show you what the thing says. If you understand that book, you get for the author. Then he opened their understanding. Amen, amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Our very first episode of The Word of a King. I am your host, Chad Reese, pastor at Lighthouse Baptist Church. And my co-host joining me is a fellow alumni of Pensacola Bible Institute and also now a teacher at Lighthouse Bible Institute, Brother Brian Beam. Brother Brian, how are you doing today? Great. Good to be saved. Pumped up for the podcast. And obviously, uh, this has been some time of prayer and something we've been wanting to do for a while, so we're looking forward to it. Uh, The purpose of the podcast, as you heard in the introduction, is to take common and controversial issues and put them to rest. Now, obviously, brother, we'll put them rest in our minds. I'm not sure if we'll put them in the rest of the minds of the the viewers and listeners, uh, but I am looking forward to tackling some controversial issues. Uh, Before we get into the subject today, which is going to be an exciting subject, uh, Again, brother, it's just been a blessing to to have you at Lighthouse. I'm glad the Lord has sent you there. We just started another semester of Lighthouse Bible Institute. And brother, how's it going so far? I know you taught one class. Been great. Taught uh, one week, Life of Christ and 2 Timothy. So a lot of stuff went over the branch and how there's four different branches and how the branches represent the four gospels and how they present Jesus Christ four different ways. And Jesus Christ is all throughout the Old Testament. He's from everlasting. He's God. So good start. Amen, amen. It's a blessing. And again, I was just really excited and thrilled of how many people signed up. And uh, in the future, for all our listeners and viewers, uh, we do plan to open up Lighthouse Bible Institute online. Right now, it's strictly for the folks at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Uh, But I think in one of your classes, you had like 21 or 22 people signed up. I know not everyone was there the first night, but some folks are going to be doing it online. But uh, man, just a just a wonderful amount of people excited about the Word of God. Amen. It's a blessing. Yeah. yeah. I told the class before we started that I've been I've been saved 24 years. I've been in all different churches, and you don't see that too often. And that's one of the discouraging things about being saved and got saved at 19. And the Word of God just I just ate it up and loved the Word of God. And I'm, you know I'm a wicked sinner like anybody else. But I it always bugged me how most Christians have no desire for the Word of God. They don't care about the Word of God. They've been saved 20, 30 years. They couldn't name you 30 books in the Bible. They don't know 10 verses. And so it's good to be at a church where there's a hunger for the Word of God. And that's a good thing. It's a natural thing. And people want to learn the Bible. And, of course, the Bible's great. We love it. And Amen. It's good to teach it. It's good to have people who have some interest in the Word of God and all that good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. The, that book, the, the King James Bible, has changed my life. I know it's changed your life. Amen. It's uh, 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 again, if you're out there watching or listening, that's how you're going to live the victorious Christian life. Uh, you need to fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And to fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to fall in love with his word because his word tells you all about your Savior. And uh, so exciting things. Uh, again, just a couple other things just I'm excited about coming up. Brother Brian, obviously the weather is breaking here in Michigan. And we are doing our first Awake Street Ministry, the fourth Sunday of March. Looking forward to going out there. And what a blessing that is to have. A, we usually have a good turnout between 30 and 40, 45 people Man. out there holding signs and preaching the Word of God and passing out tracts. And uh, so I'm sure you're looking forward to getting out back on the street also. Definitely. Good to preach the gospel and get out with other brethren that believe the Bible. And we've probably got, I don't even 12, 15 men that yeah. preach the word of God. We're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that saved sinners from hell, that saved me from hell. And what better way than to get out in hundreds and thousands of cars and vehicles at a busy intersection amen. that get to hear the gospel. And it's good. Amen, amen. I, I uh, won't detract too much, but I had an interesting conversation back and forth with someone on uh, Facebook the last couple of days on uh, one of the brothers' uh, page, but um, he was a educated historian in the languages of the Bible. And uh, of course, uh, he, he mocked the King James Bible as being caveman language. And uh, what, a, what a educated statement to say. And then, uh, of course, 
Um, he equated me to being Westboro Baptist Church because he saw a picture of me. He posted a picture of me holding a scripture sign. I mean, uh, what a thing to equate someone who's holding a Bible scripture sign to Westboro Baptist Church. I bring that up just to simply say, uh, we believe when we go out to the corners to proclaim the gospel of the grace of God, we've been commissioned. God has entrusted us with a high calling of the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. And uh, so brother, I know you've seen it probably over the years. I do believe there's a right way to street preach and I believe there's a wrong way to street preach. Absolutely. Yeah, the wrong way is put people down, insult them, make fun of them, ridicule them, just preach on sin, 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 preach in front of strip clubs, preach in front of bars. Those people can quit those sins and, and not be sinners in that way and still die in their sin and go to hell. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that we have, that Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day, and that's what saves sinners from hell. A lot of preachers don't preach that, or they hardly ever preach that, but that's what we are in total agreement on that, that we're safe sinners. We've got the good news. We've got the way out. It's totally free, and we go out publicly and tell sinners how to be saved, and that's what it's about. Amen, and, and I think that's uh, what God wants us to do. I think he's well pleased by that. We do it for the glory yeah. of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, just a couple other things, and we'll get into today's subject. Uh, obviously, um, probably... Uh, April, we'll begin our um, So in the Seed Ministry, and basically that's our door knocking on the second Sunday of the month. And again, we've had a good turnout last year. We covered a lot of Lincoln Park and uh, my immediate vision and goal, and so is the men's immediate vision goal, is to knock on every door in Lincoln Park. That's where God has us. Uh, but uh, the other one that I'm excited we're going to do this year is Singing in the Park. And I think it's going to be a great time. And we're going to do that on the third Sunday of the month. We're going to go out to the local parks near our church when the weather's nice and uh, just uh, sing some old fashioned hymns that yeah. glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and then disperse and pass out tracks. And uh, what's your thoughts on that, brother? I love it. Amen. And I said, if it does rain, we can call it singing in the rain. There you go. I like I, it, singing in the rain. I like that. I've never seen that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyways, uh, we're excited about what God's doing at Lighthouse Baptist Church. If you're looking for a church, you live in the Downriver area. We're not about trying to steal people from churches, but if you're saved, a born again Christian, you're looking for a good Bible believing church, we encourage you to come out and visit us. And uh, listen, if you're watch this podcast or listen to it, um, Today's the day of salvation. We pray for your salvation. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Well, brother, without any further ado, again, the purpose of the Word of a King podcast is to take common and controversial subjects and look at them through the lens of the Scripture and, again, to put them to rest. And uh, I think a very controversial subject that one needs to be examined is tribulation salvation. And I thought no better way to do this than to do a kind of a book review, if you want to say that, or maybe even just some highlights uh, from this book, Brother Doug Stoffer, Pastor Doug Stoffer sent me. He actually sent me three copies, which worked out well uh, because I gave one to you and one to another brother in the church, and I have one. And we've read it, we've studied it in light of the scripture. And we're going to do a little bit of a, a book review. So this is Brother Doug Stoffer's book, Tribulation Salvation. And Brother Doug Stoffer, if you're watching, I appreciate you sending these books to me. They've been great for our study on this subject. And uh, so we're going to discuss the book a little bit and do a review on it, what he says. But ultimately, the goal is to study out what the Bible says about tribulation salvation. Now, I know we're not going to probably cover all this in the first podcast, so this probably will be two, maybe three of our first episodes, but probably two, um, but tribulation, salvation. So I think before we actually get into the book, I think what's important, uh, Brother Brian, is we discuss what we believe as Bible believers, what we believe in regards to dispensations or dispens being a dispensationalist and what we believe in regards to tribulation and salvation. Oftentimes in debates or studies or arguments or however you want to say it, people build straw men. And that's basically putting up a position that they can easily tear down. And therefore, they that the listeners or viewers will equate that to your position 
and then try to be convinced of the person who's arguing that. So I, I think what's necessary for our viewers and listeners is for us to just to explain what we believe. Amen. Uh, so, Brother Ryan, why don't you just take a couple minutes and and kind of give us an overview of maybe let's start with dispensationalism, dispensations, and then maybe an overview of tribulational salvation. All right. So first of all, why is this important? Number one, it's a command. Second Timothy 2.15, the only verse in the Bible that tells you to study the Bible, also tells you how to study the Bible, tells you why to study the Bible, and tells you what happens if you don't study the Bible. But it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's a command. Number two, it greatly helps to understand the Bible. I got saved in 1996, the age of 19, and I'm reading my Bible, and I got salvation by grace through faith, eternal security, pre-trib rapture. And then I'm reading my Bible, and I see 10, 20, no, hundreds of verses in the Bible that seem to go against what I believe and what Baptists believe, and evangelicals, people that are saved, believe salvation is a free gift. And I'm running across JW that I work with, and he and I go at it, and my uncle's a deacon in the Catholic Church, and he's giving me all these verses. And I'm coming across all these verses, hundreds of verses, brother, and they don't make sense. But when I got a hold of rightly dividing the word of truth, it's the key that opens up the Bible. Right. Why do some believe in pre-trib rapture, some believe in post-trib rapture? Because they're both true. There is a post-trib rapture and there is a pre-trib rapture. But if you don't know there's two of them, you see all these verses that go against pre-trib. Then you see all these verses that go against post-trib. And well, if they're both true, then it both makes sense. So it greatly helps you understand the Bible. Number three, failure to do so creates hundreds of contradictions, like I just mentioned. Right. I believe in pre-trib, so all the verses that are post-trib, I just ignore them, or I just say they're saying something else. No, there is a post-trib, and there's a pre-trib, and there's a mid-trib, and there's all different raptures, which explains why there's all different cliques and beliefs, but it also explains how they're not contradictions. And that's the thing with dispensationalism. Some of this stuff is true to different people, and that's why it's not a contradiction. Uh, fa failure to do so creates heresy by placing non-church doctrines on the church or by placing church only doctrines on the old testament saint tribulation saint etc like you know brother stauffer in his book which a lot of people do will take a verse you know we're not saved by works the, the works of law have nothing to do with salvation well that's written by paul after the cross 20 30 years after the cross to the body of christ that doesn't necessarily mean that applies to to moses and aaron and phineas and david and hezekiah right. and josiah just as you can't take verses on like 1 Timothy 4, for example, Paul said in the latter time, they shall depart from the faith, giving uh, heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, commanding to abstain from meats. Well, does that apply to the Old Testament? If so, you're calling Jehovah God, the Holy Spirit, author of the Old Testament, the devil, because God in the Old Testament, Leviticus 11, commands you to abstain from meats. So you can't apply 1 Timothy 4 or verses that talk about circumcision availeth nothing or the Sabbath is not for today. Well, God commanded Moses to stone someone for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. So just as we understand you can't apply that to the Old Testament, you can't apply church aids doctrines on eternal security and spiritual circumcision, right. on uh, salvation by grace through faith alone. You can't read that back 1,500 years later in the Old Testament. So. And I think all those points you raise are very, very valid. And, and again, we don't want to misrepresent uh, Pastor Doug Stauffer. And obviously, we'll, we'll take any feedback or anything. We do misrepresent him. And we're not going to just read the book. If you want the book, you can get it yourself, study it yourself. We're going to highlight, give you his positions. But I think what you said is so important to this discussion. Again, it's like you clearly said, we don't take the restrictions, the Levitical law, and apply them on the church, nor do we take the liberty we have with dietary, uh, with foods that we can eat, and then place them back under the Levitical law. So what you'll find throughout this book is a constant error of applying truths written to the church and then putting them either on the Old Testament or in the tribulation. And again, that just violates what you said about we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God and, and again, the command is we have to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. And so, as you said, I do agree that is the, the key to understanding the Bible. And we'll give some more examples and we'll talk more about that. But I do believe that's important. So, and I know Brother Doug Stauffer, to an extent, he would agree with us. We need to rightly divide the word of truth. But we're, what we're saying from the get-go is he violates that principle when he takes verses 
to justify his position about the tribulation, and he quotes Ephesians right. <laughs> or Romans or right. whatever it is. And it's like, well, those are church age truths. Church and, here. Yeah, exactly. Church is raptured. I mean, I know Brother Doug Stoffer believes that. So it kind of baffles my mind that he would use his proof text that is written to the body of Christ. And I know, again, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but brother, we talked about this. I mean, the church is unique. The church mm. is special. Amen. I want, want, want to give us that verse you were talking about yeah, there. Ephesians 2, 7. And this is a wonderful reference while Brother Brian's turning there. And I, I want you to really grasp this because this will help you as we lay the foundation to this study. You have to understand the church is unique. The church is special. We are part of the body of Christ. Yeah, Ephesians 2, of course, we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were the children of disobedience, by nature children of wrath, strangers from the covenants of promise, as opposed to Israel in the Old Testament, God's people. The Gentiles were just filthy, wicked dogs. And then Ephesians 2, 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So it's to the church. Amen. Why did God do that? Why did Jesus Christ save us? Verse 7, that in the ages to come, that's in the future, <laughs> he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us, that's the church, the Gentile church, through Christ Jesus. Amen. And again, that's the ages to come. The Lord is going to point back at his bride, his body, Amen. and show again how we are unique, how we're special. And we could go on and on about the promises that we have because we are in Christ. And that's where our wealth is. That's that's where our hope is. That's where all the blessing is of being a Christian is because we're in Christ. Christ. We're part of the body of Christ. Nobody so else was. that's right. And uh, no one else will be in, yep. in the future. So I think that's important. So you raised some good, important points there just at the beginning. So what else do we have in regards to the overview? Yeah. One more point on why this is important and fa failure to do so will result in ignoring or spiritualizing hundreds of verses. That's no better. And Brother Doug Stauffer does not believe this, which is the blessing about in the Old Testament, I look forward to the cross and he, he knows enough book to know that's right. insanity. Nobody knew about Jesus Christ before the cross. The, the 12 apostles didn't know about his death, burial, resurrection. Right. Over and over and over, they didn't know about it. They misunderstood it. Peter rebuked Jesus when he yeah. told him about it. Right. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. But we're no better than an amillennialist that says, well, this verse doesn't mean this, and this doesn't mean that, and this doesn't mean that. Well, in Revelation, it says Jesus and the wolf will lie with the lamb. Oh, no, no, it doesn't really mean that. What it... That's no, that's no better when you just ignore or spiritualize hundreds of verses. Sure. Now, we're Bible believers. We can't say the Greek means this and the Hebrew says that. That's what the non-Bible believers do. Any verse they don't understand, they just go to the Greek or go to another version. Right. But Bible believers can't do this. So the fundamental Baptist crowd or the crowd that doesn't understand dispensational salvation, what they're going to do with the hundred, and you know, we've probably got three, four hundred verses on our side here. We're not going to cover them all. But they'll say, they'll either ignore it or say, well, what Jesus really meant was... And that, now and then you have to do that with the book. Sure. If it's going to contradict hundreds of clear verses. Sure. But if you're doing that over and over and over and over and over, what he really meant was, well, I don't know how to explain that or what he mean, then you need to adjust your doctrine. That's right. That's right. right. I think it's very important. And, and again, I see that oftentimes in commentaries or preaching or teaching uh, folks who, um, what I believe, they don't rightly divide the Bible and they end up spiritualizing yes. verse after verse after verse. Um, but the reason is because it will contradict their theological system or how they view the Bible through the lens they view it. And therefore, they have to spiritualize verses. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think there's... teach heresy, so right, I, right. I guess that's better than that. Yeah, definitely better than teaching heresy. Um, so, and sometimes they'll just ignore the verses. And, and again, I think we'll give some examples of this as we go on. Uh, but there's verses, if you read in the general epistles, there's verses you read in Revelation, especially chapters 1, 2, and 3, um, that you cannot literally apply to the body of Christ. It just will not work. And uh, so... Maybe, Brother Brian, I know uh, this is not necessarily in the order that we're going to go, but why don't you briefly explain then to the listeners, the viewers, how someone should approach, say, the general epistles and revelation in regards to, well, how do I know if it's for the church or not? Uh, what, what's your kind of recommendation for them, just in a general sense? My recommendation is Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. That's Romans eleven thirteen. Paul is our spokesman. Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God. Paul was, had uh, multiple mysteries revealed to him, a Christ in you, the hope of glory, the indwelling Christ, the mystery of the body of Christ. That was revealed to Paul. 
the uh, indwelling Christ, the mystery of godliness, the mystery of the rapture, 1 Corinthians 15. That's all revealed to Paul. Paul's our spokesman. We're Gentiles saved by grace in the church age. We're not Old Testament Jews. We're Jesus Christ and John the Baptist was manifest Christ to Israel. Like That's not for us. Revelation, obviously, is, is, is tribulation doctrine because it's sure. dealing with the tribulation. Right, right, right. So Paul is our spokesman. Paul is our is the one from whom we mainly get doctrine. So I would say if it goes against Paul, salvation by grace through faith plus nothing, eternal security, pre-tribulation rapture, the indwelling Christ, we're the body of Christ. Anything that goes against that, either the Bible has contradictions or it's not for the church and it's written to a different group of people. It's Old Testament. It's tribulation. There's verses in the Bible on the millennium. Right. There's verses on the Bible after the millennium. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. And in the general epistles... I'm not as hyper and go that far as other people, but I think almost all of 1 Peter, almost all of 1 John, those two specifically, right. and 2 and 3 John, there's, you know, it's just one chapter, nothing controversial in those two. It all, almost all lines sure. up with Paul. 1 John is some of the greatest verses on eternal security. Absolutely. 1 John chapter 3 talks about the uh, that we cannot sin because right. his seed remaineth in him. Right. That's as much Pauline as anything. Right. In First John chapter three, I can't sin. I've been right. that matches up with Colossians two, spiritual circumcision. First uh, John five, these things have written on you that believe in the name of the Son of God. You may know that you have eternal life. I mean, every soul winner uses that verse to show somebody after they're saved that they can't lose salvation. Which, amen for that. But that lines up with Paul. So you don't you don't have to throw out First John, the general epistles. Right. And there's a lot of stuff in Hebrews and James even that doctrinally there's a lot of problems with Hebrew, Hebrews and James. I would say those two books specifically. Sure, sure. And of course, Revelation. But there's a lot in Hebrews and James that, that's for the church. Absolutely. You know? well, I think, and again, as you you alluded to so greatly, or not alluded to, that you express so greatly is Paul's our spokesman. We need to filter the general epistles in the book of Revelation through what the Apostle Paul said, what he wrote. And, you know, I read a great book several years ago, and in one of the chapters it talked about not reading somebody else's mail. Uh, that was a good book. Wrote that. It was a great book. <laughs> it was a great book. I don't first know what edition, to that guy. First edition, by the way. <laughs> and and, and uh, so what happens is when you take the general epistles and if the stuff's not written to you, you're reading someone else's mail. But but I, I think this is a natural segue, brother, to to a point that I think we need to clarify. Again, we want to tell you what we believe as Bible believers. Amen. We don't want someone to misrepresent us. So so with that said, we are not hyper dispensationalists. I concur with what Brother Brian said, the general epistles, there's so much truth, doctrinal truth that is written to the church. Uh, I know, again, even the book of Hebrews, and now obviously Hebrews has a very tribulational slant because it's written to the Hebrews. Wow. And yeah, <laughs> mind blowing, <laughs> huh? deep, that? deep. And, and, and here's the thing. We, before we were in Christ, we were lost Gentiles who were outside the promises of God. We had no hope, but we didn't understand the law. We didn't understand the sacrifice. We didn't understand the priesthood, nor did we care about them. But a Jew does. And the book of Hebrews is to convince the Jew that Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of all those things they did in the Old Testament. And obviously that's very important to that tribulational, tribulational Jew. And again, so that's why it's in there. Now, all those truths about Jesus Christ being the final sacrifice and his blood and all the truths in Hebrews obviously is true to the church. But there is passages in there that deal with tribulational salvation that you can't make apply to the church if you take them literally. But as I was saying, I think this is a good segue into explaining why we're not hyper dispensationalists. So Brother Brian, if if you were just to take a minute or two and explain to the viewers what is a hyper dispensationalist so they understand why we are not. Because I, I would say that's one thing Brother Doug does often in this book yes. is he conflates mm -hmm. us, I think Bible believers, as hyper dispensationalists. I think he knowingly does it. I think he understands the difference. But... I, I, have to, I have to say too, and again, Brother Doug, feel free to comment. It, it does seem pretty intentional. I mean, I think Brother Doug knows what a hyper dispensationalist truly is versus what a Bible believer is. Right. Um, and, and again, I think most people who study the Bible understand the lingo we are using. If you don't, it's okay. Um, but the idea is there is a distinction what a hyper dispensationalist is. Be before I turn over to you to make those comments, it's kind of like the idea is if you know you have one more conviction than me, then you're a Pharisee. Or if you have one less, then you're a liberal. I mean, that's just people throwing out terms to put labels on people. 
And I feel that Brother Doug does that often in this book. And again, I think he does it to, to build up a straw man to try to tear it down, to tear down the truth of what we as Bible believers believe. Um, but, you know, he knows his intentions and he's feel free to comment if he would like. But so let's get down to the root of it. What would you classify as a hyper dispensationalist? Amen. You mentioned whose mail is it? A good verse is Romans 15.4. It says, Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, Paul talking about the Old Testament, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. We believe all the Bible is written for you, not all the Bible is written to you. I believe doctrinally Proverbs, Psalms, James, Hebrews, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all applies to the church unless it goes against Paul. A hyper-dispensationalist is pretty much only going to focus on Paul's 13 epistles. And some of them even go even further and say only his prison epistles, which are the later ones he wrote, which he was, a, he, you know, he talked about being a bondman in prison. Ephesians, Colossians, that's when the mystery was revealed. And the hyper's big problem, he's got a couple, but one is that the mystery of the body of Christ was revealed to Paul, 100% true. Sure. But they think that means it wasn't there before Paul wrote Romans or Corinthians or Galatians, right. which is nonsense. The body of Christ was in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down to Pentecost. So they're only going to use Paul's epistles and they're going to leave out some things like uh, they don't believe in confessing sins mm -hmm. because the verse on if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness is in 1 John 1. And number one, I, I've been through this with hypers. I don't think that goes against Paul, but they're like, where did Paul say confess sins? And that's the verse is 1 John. So it's an ultra grace as far as right. practically. Right. They don't believe in confessing sins. They believe that New Jerusalem is for Israel. They don't believe that they believe born again is not applied to the body of Christ because mm -hmm. it's only in John and Peter. And they ignore the Gospels a lot. And they just they put so much emphasis on Paul, the Pauline epistles, and they're all about Paul and Peter and the difference between Peter and Paul and Paul and Peter. And they just get all doctrinal. I've known one, I knew a guy, you know, in Pensacola, there's right. a lot of hypers, and they, they call themselves Bereans, or they follow Stan Bollinger, Baker O'Hare, E.C. Moore was one. But these guys, I knew one guy that was a street preacher, but for the most, they don't street preach, they're not evangelistic. Right. And Dr. Ruckman warned us about it at PBI. Right. The two things that'll deaden a church faster than anything is hyper dispensationalism and hyper Calvinism. That's right. So they just put way too much emphasis on Paul's epistles, which we are not hypers. Right. We believe all the Bible, we preach all the Bible, we teach all the Bible. And all of it applies to the church doctrine. It all practically applies today. I don't know, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit murder. I, I think that applies today. Yeah. I think God still doesn't want to commit murder. <laughs> right. I don't think that's done away because it's the Old Testament. So the hyper just only focuses on Paul. And that's not what we are. And we're against the hypers. Yeah. So. And you raised some good points I think worthy of expounding on is, uh, for instance, um, being born again, obviously, John chapter 3 and First Peter, um, what is it, two, 123, yeah. And so obviously, you got John, you got First Peter, general epistles, and they would say, see, the new birth, uh, Paul doesn't say you must be born again. It doesn't talk about new birth, but but that's just not true. Uh, you know, it's, as you said, I mean, you're having a conversation, that's just a lazy man's way to study the Bible. Yes. So so give us a couple of references where, where Paul does address the new birth. Uh, Titus 3.5 is a great one. Uh, says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. There it is. And renewing of the Holy Ghost. Re is again, generate to be born, genetics, gene, uh, John 3.16, the only begotten, the Greek, not the, getting Greek, but the Greek is monogenes, only begotten, born, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Titus 3.5 is born again. Just the doctrine of uh, the church age salvation is a new birth. Right. We're right. saved instantly. We have a new man inside of us, the new man and the old man, spiritual circumcision. That's the new birth. It's a one time experience. So we're uh, baptized in the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 12. Right. The whole idea of being born again is a church age only doctrine. There's nothing about anyone being born again before or after or in the millennium. That's crazy. And I, and I know Paul addresses that, and in, in, uh, I think it's in 1 Corinthians where he talks about how you had 10,000 instructions, but he says, I've begotten you yes. through the gospel. Again, so he doesn't have to say the word born again or new birth, Lazy. Um, but the Bible is clear that I believe that we as Christians, we've been born again. There was a day, place, and a time that I was made a new creature in Christ. And uh, again, so, uh, but I want to clarify, we are not hyper dispensationalists. So you'll see all throughout his book where, yeah. where he kind of lumps everyone into this category. Now, now with that said, I understand 
he's writing a book and you can't cover everyone's position. And even some of my good friends and Bible even brethren may not agree with every statement we just said about um, the general epistles and that. Some probably lean a little bit more stricter than we do. Um, but I do believe that's a danger that, that we'll talk about in another podcast that I think will be good on hyper dispensationalists and why we do believe there's a lot of the general epistles that applies doctrinally to the church. Um, so to summarize, I believe you can spot a hyper dispensationalist, and I know you mentioned this, by when they say the body of Christ started, when the church started. And again, I hold to the position that it started in Acts chapter two, they had to go to Jerusalem to wait for the promise of the father. The promise was the father was Jesus said, I'll send another comforter. That another comforter was the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says it's the Holy Ghost, which I find interesting because that uh, phrase Holy Ghost is not in the Old Testament. Hmm. because they did not have the permanent indwelling Holy Spirit, but we do. Amen. And uh, so um, I, I say the, by the body of Christ, the church started in Acts chapter two. You start talking to people who says it's Acts chapter nine or Acts chapter 28, most likely you're dealing with a hyper dispensationalist. And again, the danger of that is you throw out so many truths written to the church doctrinally, like confessing sins, like baptism, and uh, so, again, we are not hyper-dispensationalists. So if you do pick up a copy of Brother Doug Stoffer's book, Tribulation Salvation, just beware of the lumping everyone together as hyper-dispensationalists. And uh, that takes out a lot of his arguments. But uh, again, we'll get into the book a little bit further. A good verse on the hypers also is 1 Timothy 6, where Paul says, If any man consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, which I believe are found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes. Right. Paul s tells the people that ignore the words are proud, knowing nothing. Acts 20, with the Ephesian elders, he says, Remember ye the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Which, by the way, is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> In interesting right. little nugget right, there. Right. And uh, there, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 10, talks about the... Uh, things written aforetime, and the, they were our samples. Paul uses Old Testament and teaches. Sure, like, sure. Yeah, the hypers are walkers. Yeah. So, uh, again... You just have to understand, we are not hyper-dispensationalists. Um, there's a lot of danger uh, in hyper-dispensationalists. They will kill a church. So, Amen. But uh, again, trying to stay back on subjects, so let's do some more overview. All right, so overview of dispensational salvation with Brother Chad and I believe God has not always saved every single person from the Adam and Eve to the millennium and even outside of the millennium the same way. And here's some points on why we just a basic overview of what we believe. Number one, many kept the law or are said to be righteous. We believe that because the Bible says that over <laughs> and over and over. And But you need to understand what that does and does not mean. Right. So I had uh, 1 Kings 11. We'll look at a verse here. And Brother Chad has a verse. I think from Luke. Right? Yes, sir. 1 Kings 11. This is David who committed adultery, who committed murder, who in his pride numbered Israel. And then God had, uh, I believe, 70,000 people killed. Sounds like a... Sounds like a sinner. Sounds like somebody broke God's law, right? Yeah. All right, here's 1 Kings 11.34. I believe it's God talking Rehoboam and the kingdom split and all that kind of thing. He says, Howbeit, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. So keeping commandments and keeping statutes does not mean being sinless right. or never breaking the law. Or God just lied because David wasn't sinless. David broke the law and God himself said, David kept my commandments. So when we say we believe you have to have commandments and faith and grace and the blood of Jesus Christ, which we believe, but you all, there is an element of works. Right. And Stauffer acts like that's absurd. Nobody can keep the law. Nobody's sinless. Nobody's perfect. It doesn't mean sinless and perfect. David kept the law according to God himself. Right. Right. And David broke the law. He committed some horrible sins yeah. that most lost people don't even commit. <laughs> and God said he kept the law. Yeah, and that's just an excellent point. Again, we, we have to just stick to what the book says. Yes. In regards to that, I, I never understand this argument other than if you're going to run to passages written to the church to try to justify your position. But last time I read the law, Brother Brian, weren't the sacrifices part of the law? Yes. <laughs> And the reason they're part of the law is because God knew that man would violate the law. Therefore, they had to offer these sacrifices so they could what? Keep the law because those were part 
of the law. Yes. Now, the outcome, obviously, and uh, and again, we'll get more probably detailed into this. The outcome, I believe, in the Old Testament, um, all the Old Testament, is a man was either viewed as wicked or righteous. And, and then during the law, if a man kept the law, <laughs> that means he did what the law said, and when he sinned, he offered those sacrifices, he was counted righteous. We have this example very clearly in the Bible. Uh, as Brian said, Luke chapter 1 is talking about Zacharias and Elizabeth. And Luke chapter 1, verse 6, says this about them. The Bible says, and they were both righteous. No, nobody's righteous. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't say that, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, here they is. <laughs> and, and guess what? They were both righteous, hold on, without the blood of Christ. That seems to pose a problem to those who want to make everything the same. Now, let, let me just state real quick, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to develop this further. I do not believe they had the same righteousness as you and I had, Brother yeah, Brian. Sure. We have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'll, I'll give another verse here in a moment, or you can give it. Um, what the righteousness they had, I believe, is personal righteousness that came by the law. And when they kept the law, which included when they broke it to offer those sacrifices, God would see them righteous. Now, it says in verse 6, and they were both righteous before God. How? walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Here is Zacharias and Elizabeth. They are righteous because they're walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the law, blameless. And again, the Bible, I believe, is very clear that personal righteousness comes by the law. You got a, you got any verse on that you want to expound or you want me to expound? I know... Uh, we had, Philippians three is a good yeah one. Philippians chapter three what is that Romans ten I could read that yeah Romans go to go to Romans ten Romans ten this is one of the greatest verses to show the difference in the law it's the exact opposite of they were looking forward to the cross or the exact opposite of salvation this is Paul talking about lost Jews in his days Romans ten three for they being ignorant of God's righteousness that's what saves a sinner. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation, everyone that believeth. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. We get God's righteousness. That's we're right. sinless. We're perfect. All my sins are on Jesus Christ. I can go to heaven. I can never, I can never sin. I'm sinless before God. I have eternal security because I have God's righteousness through the gospel of Jesus Christ. They did not have that under the law. I'll keep reading. And going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God for Christ... Not Moses, That's not it. Abraham. Christ is the end of the law for what? For righteousness. There it is. Sounds like it maybe used to be for righteousness. That's right. But I'll keep reading. To everyone that believeth. Now, what was righteousness under the law? I think Paul might tell us here. For Moses, not Brother Stauffer, not Brother Beam, not, not Brother Chad. Moses is going to tell us. Moses described, I think Moses might know about it. Yeah. Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. Well, that's good because that's what we're talking about. That's right. Salvation under the law. The church has gone during the tribulation. It's going to be the same setup as it was under the law. That's right. Moses is going to go ahead and tell us. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Hmm. But the righteousness which is of faith kind of sounds like it might be the opposite. That's right. Speaketh on this wise, say not who shall ascend into heaven, who shall descend into the deep, but the word is neither even thy mouth, if thou shalt confess and Paul gets into the gospel. He black and white contrasts it with the law. Right. He tells you what the law is. Moses tells you what the law is. But it's the same, I guess, from what <laughs> Brother Stauffer says and what the fundamental... Uh, yeah, and, and <laughs> so I think it'd be very reasonable and fair to say, as you said, that Paul is contrasting righteousness that came by the law versus righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that Amen. we get. But that doesn't change the fact that they were counted righteous when they kept the commandments. So people can keep the law and be counted righteous. Paul says in Philippians chapter three, verse nine, and being found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. Again, the law, a man would be seen as righteous. He had his own personal righteousness. The rest of that verse says, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Again, there you have the contrast. Different. Exactly. Of the righteousness that came by the law, 
personal righteousness and the righteousness that came by faith, which is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we get his imputed righteousness. But brother Brian, doesn't this naturally lead us to why when the old Testament saint, although they were counted righteous, when they died, they didn't go to heaven. So where did they go? Brother Brian? Luke 16 tells us they went to Abraham's bosom, which was in the heart of the earth. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 4, it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. God forgave them, but their sins were not taken away. That's why they could not go to heaven because, you know, there can't be any sin in heaven. Right. Jesus Christ hadn't died yet. The blood of Jesus Christ, which applies to everybody, which we'll get into that later, the blood of Jesus Christ hadn't occurred yet. So the Old Testament saints could not go to heaven because they still had sin on them. God forgave them, but he did not take away their sin. They weren't spiritually circumcised. They weren't born again. They weren't part of the body of Christ. They did not have God's righteousness. They had their own personal righteousness. That's why they didn't go to heaven. That's why they went to Abraham's bosom. And that's why it's so different in so many ways. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think uh, that's just, again, hopefully you're following along with our our, our just excitement about this book. It is, it is exciting. And uh, so just kind of uh, summarize this point and we'll move on. There, there's two things I want to emphasize. And uh, I do think we'll get in some of these a little bit more in detail. What we are saying and what we believe the Bible teaches clearly that in the Old Testament, a man was either counted wicked or righteous. The, the issue is not saved or lost in the Old Testament. Yes. And that brings me to my next point. I don't believe anyone was saved in the Old Testament. I don't believe anyone saved in the tribulation until the end. It reverts back to an Old Testament economy of wicked versus righteous. And uh, we'll do a whole segment on that to show how it reverts back. But I think when someone wraps their mind around it and quits using church age promises and applying them to the tribulation, they see that it reverts back to an Old Testament setup of either wicked versus righteous. So we believe that in the Old Testament, if a man did or the Bible says, obeys what God tell, told him to do, mm -hmm. then he was counted righteous. If he didn't, he would be counted wicked. And in, in our dispensation, the dispensation, dispensation of the grace of God, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We get put into Christ. We get the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. But again, the body of Christ is special. It's unique. When God raptures his church, those promises to the church get raptured with them, with us. So, uh, Brother Brian, anything else you want to add to that? Or um... Let's throw out a verse, Hebrews 5.8. Um, in a sense, I believe everybody's saved the same way. Hebrews 5.8 right. says that he became the author of eternal salvation to them that obey him. I believe everybody's saved the same way. That's and right. that they're saved by doing what God told them. Paul in Romans 10 says to obey the gospel is to believe the gospel. That's good. People today are saved by believing the gospel, not by getting baptized in water, not by enduring to the end, not by refusing the mark, not by looking for his coming and now unfaithful servant and depart from me and the curse, not by taking care of the Jew in Matthew 25. That's why today it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Was It wasn't that in the Old Testament. Right. It's not that in the tribulation. It's not that in the millennium where there'll be a millennial temple where Jesus will be visibly, physically, literally on the earth with millions of replicas in us that will be resurrected and have a body just like him. And people, even in eternity, which we'll get into later, I hope, because it's a really good point, you got some tree of life thing popping up yeah. and you got to right. eat that thing and you can't enter into a city. Right. What does that have to do with us? Nothing. Right. I am the city. Yeah. I'm in the city. I'm with Jesus forever in right. New Jerusalem. But there's some kind of nations that... Have to eat a fruit. Like, how are you going to apply that to the church? There's so many things you can't. That was apply their to the instructions. Church. That's got nothing to do with me eating a tree, right? Anyway, you know, I mean, I know. I think all of that is wonderful. And again, so I want to be very clear. We believe that uh, nobody is saved outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Nobody. Amen. The Old Testament saints are saved outside the blood of Jesus Christ. The tribulation saints are not saved outside the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why we say they are not saved. They're not born again until the end. And we'll get into all those verses there. Uh, the big error is talking about them being saved and losing it. 
I don't think they lose anything. Do you, Brother Brian? No, they don't have it. That's right, because they're not saved. Right. And that's the same thing in the Old Testament. That's why it's a setup of the wicked versus the righteous. And, and what you'll see is that a man can turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and yeah. then he's counted as a wicked person. Uh, so again, uh, I think those are clear points we need to lay out there so people understand that everybody, everybody sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. The only reason anyone's ever going to get to heaven yes. is by the blood of Jesus Christ. Here's the issue is how do you get the blood applied? In the Old Testament, they got the blood applied by being counted righteous. Then they died and went to Abraham's bosom and they had to wait for that blood to be applied before they could go to heaven. Uh, John 14, 6 is true in every age and every dispensation. The question is, how do they get the blood applied? Amen. All right, what's next? All right, next point, an overview of dispensational salvation that we believe just um, the law passages. What Brother Stauffer does and, and Brother Knox does the same thing is that Clearly, the, the Bible talks about under the law in the Old Testament that it was for righteousness. But they say that's just physical righteousness. That's just so God would bless them, bless the land, bless their crops, destroy their enemies, multiply them, which is true. But it's not only that. They try to suggest it's only that point. And I, I got two good verses sure. on that to show it's to the individual. Exodus 20, verse 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that believe on Jesus Christ and have faith only. No, that love me and keep my commandments. And then Hebrews 10, 28 is another good one, which I have memorized and it suddenly slipped my mind. It says, he that despised Moses, he, not a nation, not right. a nation. That's right. what say, it's just national, it's just physical blessings, it's just blessing the land, it's just long life, it's just your kids will live long, which is true, but it's not only that. Hebrews 10, 28, he that despised Moses' law as an individual died without mercy. Mm. That is not true for the church age. Whether you despise Moses' law or keep Moses' law or have good works or don't have good works, you will not die without mercy. That's good. So what would they say? Well, what that really means is, and they're just going to throw it out. And I've got, I could go on and on and right. we'll get into it later. But there's so many verses where the law does apply to an individual. Galatians 3 just says, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. I just gave you two verses. They're cursed and they die without mercy if they did not keep the law of Moses. That's not true today. And that's what we call works. That, that's right. And, and again, so your point is well taken. Mercy, dying without mercy, that's talking about their death or dying without mercy has nothing to do with, with physical life. They're dying without mercy. You know what you need to get into heaven? You need the mercy of God Amen. is by his mercy. And so again, this shows you that although there is no doubt a physical blessing attached to the nation of Israel mm -hmm. if they obey God and follow the statutes and commandments. That doesn't nullify, that doesn't do away with how God saw them as either wicked or righteous. And I, and I think that whole conversation is omitted in his book. It's basically yeah. just like, uh, you know, he shows that it means physical life and physical blessings. We agree with that. Yeah. There is a connection. They had physical blessings, physical promises, but that didn't change the fact that um, that they got righteousness. They were seen as righteous by keeping the law. Matter of fact, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 24 and 25 says, and the Lord God commanded us to do all these statues, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. See, it's just physical. That's just physical, right? Yeah. Now, again, we agree. There's physical blessings. The next verse. But, <laughs> but, as you said, next verse. Yeah. But that also is how God sees them. You can't just stop with the physical blessings. We, we agree. There are physical blessings associated with if they obeyed God and did his commandments. But look what the next verse says in verse 25. And it shall be our righteousness. Hmm. That's not just physical blessings. That's how God sees them. Are they wicked or righteous? How? If we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. Again, clearly, physical blessings associated with the nation of Israel for doing what God said for keeping the commandments. But also clearly, one is seen by God righteous 
if they keep his commandments. And that's what I believe is missing. What do you got next? Amen. So number three, the black and white contrast of the law with the gospel. We already read Romans 10, talking yeah. about Paul's comparing. Uh, Galatians 3 talks about bondage of the law. And we did kind of uh, go off on that already. You got another verse. We definitely can uh, expound on that further. But, but I think over and over again, that's what you see Paul does. And what is the point? The point is they, that means they are not the same. Paul contrasts the law compared to what we have in Christ. Yeah, I think it diminishes the blood of Christ and the glorious salvation that we have by saying, oh, yeah, everybody's always saved like that. Right. It's just a different object. They, you know, they believed in God just like we do. And Moses and Noah believed in God like we do. And the, we're what, different. We're special. We're God's trophies into eternity. What was the point of, of sending his son if they could simply just believe God? And like you said, I do believe it does diminish the payment that Jesus Christ made on the cross of Calvary. There is a complete... A, a, contrast between us and the Old Testament. Anything else you want to add on that that we kind of already didn't ramble on or rant on? And No, that's good. The next one would be the bondage, the bondage of the law. Now, people say that's just physical. You got to keep the Sabbath and you got to have the observances and you got to have the feast of the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread and the feast of weeks and tabernacles and all that. Well, let's see if that's true. Yeah, Galatians 4.24, and then I would take it to Hebrews 2.15. Galatians 4.24, which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, that's the law, that's Paul contrasting the law with what we have today, which there's so many contrasts with Paul's, sure, why, are they, sure. why if they're the same? Right. All right, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. So again, oh, that bond, Stauffer, Brother Stauffer would say, oh, that's just bondage about keeping the law. We don't have to do that and keep the Sabbath. Had nothing to do with salvation, that's what they would say. We right. say it had to do with right. salvation. Sure. They say it doesn't. Let's see if it did. Hebrews 2.15. Let's see what this bondage is. Hebrews 2.14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy them, destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death mm. were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That bondage of the law was fear of death. Mm, that's Why? Good. Because of what we've already said about right. the law. You never knew if you were going to be righteous before God. There wasn't a one time I accept Jesus into my heart. Lord, right. I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. I confess my... You know, not that kind of... They didn't have that. So all their lifetime, they were in fear of death. Paul uses that, calls it bondage, just like Hebrews 2.15 calls it bondage and says it's fear of death their whole mm. lifetime. And Paul says, we are no longer under that. That makes no sense if they're the same. If what Brother Stauffer says is true, everybody's always been saved by grace, through faith, Plus nothing, no works, no commandments, nothing. It's all, it's all been the same. Everybody's always been the same. Well, that doesn't make any sense as sure. well as hundreds of other passages which we'll get into, you know? Yeah, so there, the bondage clearly from the law is connected with the fear of death. And, you know, I know for the Christian, for me, I, I, I don't fear death. You know why? I'm not under the bondage yes. of the law. Amen. I know where I will spend eternity. I have the promises of God to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Paul said uh, that it that it is to be. It's far better to be with Christ. And again, we have those promises that they did not have in the Old Testament, and that's why they needed to keep the commandments. That way, they could die righteous. What do you got next on the on here? I have, some of these are a little redundant, they kind of over the same thing. How one obtained mercy under the law versus the church, which we, we've already looked at that. Sure. They obtained mercy according to God by keeping his commandments. They died without mercy if they broke God's commandments. Sure. sure. We obtain mercy, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, but according to his mercy saved us by the washing regeneration. Ephesians 2 talks about, you know, a great salvation passage and how we get mercy through that, uh, through Jesus Christ. Another point, the law's role in righteousness before the church mm. compared to now, which we already looked at that. And I have another one that's really interesting, something I came up with. I didn't write the verse down. I have, you know, there's more than one way for God to forgive sin. We didn't talk about this either, so I'm sure you agree with this. Oh, that's good. I found 13 ways that God forgave sins according to God in the Bible. What are they? What do you have? I gotta find it. Oh, <laughs> I thought you had them. <laughs> I don't have mine. Where is that? I thought it was in Daniel 9 or Isaiah. 
Of course, we know he forgives by the blood of Jesus Christ. Why don't you go to Ezekiel 18? Okay. And I found the verse because I know you know you got a good one there in Ezekiel 18 or Ezekiel 33. Mm -hmm. He talks about ways to forgive sin. Right. That's one of them. So you're looking here like 19. Yeah. Yet say ye. Man turn, you know, that kind of thing. Yep. Uh, So verse 20, the soul that sinneth that shall die. Again, notice the soul that sinneth that shall die. Now we understand that's because there's no spiritual circumcision yet. But the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful sounds and right. Like sounds like a lot like works. He shall surely live and shall not die. Brother Brian, don't you say that's where a lot of these sinless perfection street preachers who don't know the gospel get that whole thing from about turning from, from all sins. your sins? Yes. It's because it's in the Bible. Yeah, exactly. It's wrongly applied. It's a lot in the Bible. It's not rightly, it's not rightly divided. Right. Then it Which, says, what's wrong with that if it's the same? That's right. If Why it's is the that same. not true if it's the same today as it was under the law? If everything's the same, right. then you got to turn from all your sins. Obviously, it's not. Verse 22, and all his transgressions that he had committed, they shall not be mentioned unto really? him. So I thought, I thought this was just physical life. You mean... It sounds individual to me. See, and also sounds like, you know, your wickedness can be forgotten. It doesn't sound like just, just physical life and blessing. All right, and it says there... Then shall not be mentioned unto him, in his righteousness he had done, he shall live. Is that a lost man? Does that sound like a lost man to you? Mm. Doesn't sound like a lost man <laughs> they anymore. They would say it's a lost man, I yeah. guess. Uh, have I pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and that not he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abomination that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he had done shall not be mentioned in his trespasses that he had trespassed, listen, and in his sin that he had sinned, in them shall he die. This is a man who was righteous, who turned from his righteousness. Yes, physically, there's a consequence there, but also says in his sins, he shall die. That reminds me of what the Lord Jesus Christ said in John chapter uh, 8, right. 21, 24, yeah. where he talks about if you die in your sins, believe you, that he. that's right, believe not that I am he. He says what? You cannot go where I go. And obviously he went to the right hand of the father. So again, this is much more than just physical, it determines, yes, not only physical blessings and curses, like the Bible clearly says. And he calls the man righteous. And he calls him righteous. Saved. You can't say it's a wicked lost man. <laughs> right. That's what they would say. Well, that's just a lost man. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. But uh, so, um, again, clearly, as we said over and over again, the Old Testament economy is, is someone counted wicked or are they counted righteous? And according to Ezekiel chapter 18, that is not based... On if they believe in Jesus Christ, no, nothing about faith. On what they do, works according to God's statutes and commandments. Works, 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 works. There's a dress to a wicked man. If I see a wicked man and he's lost and he's going to hell and he's not saved, he doesn't know Jesus Christ. I'm not going to say, you know what, pal, turn from your sin, do what's right, and you'll live. That is heresy. You're a heretic, and you should die. I mean, that's that's horrible. Right. That is heresy. Paul would kick someone out of a church for that. You have, right. like, nobody would ever come anywhere in our church and sure. tweet said or tea said to, to kids or anything. That's what God said. Right. There's a wicked man and he's lost and he's going to die in his sins. And Ezekiel tells him from God, obviously, quit your sinning and do right. That's works, 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 Catholic, JW, whatever you want to call it. Right. That is the exact opposite of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if everything's always been the same, then let's put that on the body. It's exactly. Let's put it on the body and start preaching it. And if you and know... Some, some preachers do. Right. And if you know that it's not the same, that proves our point that what we have in Jesus Christ is amen. not the same what they had under Thank the you. law. Amen. 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 So again, a man's either wicked or he's righteous. It's not saved or lost. We're born again. We're saved. They weren't in the Old Testament. And listen, they are not in the tribulation until the end. That's why they must endure until the end. Again, we'll get into the details of that.
But that was one of the reasons, one of the ways, I have 13 ways God forgives sins. And we're going over different points on why we rightly divide the word of right. truth, why we believe people are not always saved the same way, why Brother Stauffer's position is wrong. And this is point number nine, <laughs> which point eight was Ephesians 2, 7. We're special, we're different. We already covered that. Point nine is God forgives sin. God can do whatever he wants. Right. They try to ram these church age doctrines on the Old Testament and say, God can't do this and can't do that. Right. And you, God can do whatever he wants. And you know what? God forgives sin 13 different ways he read one keep the law do right another one turn from your sins and repent that's also in ezekiel it's isaiah 55 7 let the wicked forsake his way here's a street preacher verse and the unrighteous man his thoughts <laughs> let him return unto the lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our god for he will abundantly pardon quit your wickedness and god will forgive your sin that's according to god now that's obviously old testament right that's not for the church i got another one do you know god can forgive sins with a live coal <laughs> That's Isaiah good. 6. Right. That's good. He said he's a sinner, and God told that uh, seraphim, Isaiah 6, to take the live coal, and he said, I'll take away your sin. Yeah. Can God do that? Yeah, because God said he did. That's right. Number two, Christ's death, obviously. Right. Colossians 1.14, yeah. in whom we have redemption through his blood that forgives us of sins. Number three, blood sacrifice, Leviticus 4, verse 20, says that God forgave the individual sin right. when he offered the sacrifice. Number four, confessing sin. Now, I think that would apply doctrinally, salvation-wise sure. in the Old Testament, but to the Christian, it applies practically as far as a practical daily sin. It's, it's our fellowship. fellowship. It's yeah. our fellowship, not it's our, our sonship. today. Exactly. That's but clear in John was, 1. But I think the wicked, or uh, Proverbs 28, 13, sure. whoso confesseth and forsaketh the sin sure. shall have mercy. Number five, imputation. We have that today. God imparts Jesus Christ, imputes his righteousness to us, imputes our sin to him. But Numbers 23, who was that? Was that Phineas? Yes. That he had imputed righteousness yes. for throwing a javelin at someone. Yeah. Number six, restitution and works. We won't turn all these. That's Leviticus six one through seven. Uh, it said God in Leviticus said he would forgive them for like, I think the concept is, is, is doing a brother wrong or taking something that wasn't his, and you sure. restore him and get and pay a penalty. And God will forgive your sin for that. I guess God can do that. Here's here's a good one. Non blood sacrifices. Leviticus five. They're to offer a meal off. Yeah. Right. Flour. Right. And God will forgive him without blood. Sure. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. When I saw that, I thought, wow, that kind of goes against even what we, we kind of teach and believe as sure. Baptists. Sure. You know, without the shedding of blood in Old Testament, yeah. the Passover. Well, apparently God can do that. Yeah. Because he can do whatever he wants. Sure. Sure. All right. I'll just read a uh, prayer. Uh, John 5, Acts 8 with uh, Simon the sorcerer. And he, he asked Peter to pray for him that God will forgive his sin. Do you um, mean you can get forgiven by praying? That's, that's, that's a, a different one. I, we'll, we'll do a, no, just the whole thing about sinner's you know prayer. sinner's prayer. Yeah. We'll do a whole podcast on that. Yeah. That's a silly argument. But anyways. We might disagree on that. Uh, maybe. No. Maybe not. Maybe. All no, right. No. Faith. Non-gospel faith. Luke 7. I think Jesus says your faith has saved thee. Mm. Or I've forgiven your sins because of your faith. Uh, you forgive others. God will forgive your sin if you forgive others. That's true. Matthew 6. If you forgive men the trespasses, your Father will forgive you. Um, and Baptism. I know we, we yeah. might even disagree on this, but Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Sure. Luke chapter 3, John preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Mm -hmm. I know even some of my crowd, maybe you, Brother Chad, we haven't talked about this, say that their sins were already forgiven. I don't think that's so, but it's not a big deal. Cause sure. In Luke 3, he's, they said, who, uh, who, war, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Generation of vipers. John said them. Right. And they're like, what do we do, John? He said, believe on Jesus, you'll be saved. No, John the Baptist didn't say that. <laughs> quit doing evil. Uh, quit killing people, right. you, you uh, Roman soldiers. That's not the gospel. It's the opposite of the gospel. So God can forgive sins all different ways. That's yeah. one of the dispensational points here. Yeah, and again, that'll be a wonderful podcast in the future. We'll talk about you know baptism and Acts chapter 2 yeah. and all that fun stuff. And um, But no, I don't think we're probably that far off. Uh, the problem is people just don't want to read and believe the book. And I'm not saying that just if you don't come to our conclusion on every little detail. Again, me and Brother Brian probably don't agree on every little detail. He Amen. believes the book. I believe the book. And uh, I meant to say this introduction, so let me just say this now. I don't believe Brother Doug Stoffer doesn't believe the book. I believe he believes no. the book. Amen. And I think the idea is that you have to come to our conclusion on every issue and agree on every passage. Otherwise, you're not a Bible believer. 
it's just an arrogant position and it's not the right spirit. Um, so I believe Brother Doug Stoffer is a Bible believer. And uh, I know some of the brethren probably will will not like that comment, but I do. I believe he's a Bible he believer. Did, he doesn't correct the book. No, he doesn't correct the book. He's a Bible believer. It's no. just, I believe his interpretation is wrong. Now, again, he would say that about uh, you and I, but yeah. that's fine. But uh, again, so interesting stuff on water baptism. I'd love to discuss that. I, I think there's a whole lot of truth there. Um, so I, I won't divert too much there. But the point is you're bringing up just how God forgives sins. And, it, and it's not just one manner. No. Throughout the book, God's got different 13 manners. ways. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and, and that's 13 ways you found. There might even be more examples. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah. So I think that leads to kind of point I want to bring up is we, we kind of started this discussion on what is dispensationalism? What is rightly dividing? And just a simple illustration, the we'll one next example is I believe simply like a soap dispenser. You you push it or put your hand under it and it dispenses something out. That's what a dispensation is. God dispenses truth to a man that was either unknown or hid and now he gives it to them and they live by those truths or they're supposed to live by those truths. That's what a dispensation is. Not a period of time? No, not a period of time um, because Amen. you have you have Amen. the dispensation of God. That's, yes. how, that's a hard to have a period of time. Now, obviously, dispensations occur in period of times. They occur within covenants and covenants is more of period of time, I think, than dispensations are. Um, but some of the things that are dispensed will carry on through different dispensations. Yeah. But, but again, my point is I just want you to understand what a dispensation is. It's the dispensing of truth to somebody by God that was either hid or unknown, and God now gives it to that man, and they are ought to live by it. A prime example, and I think everyone can follow this simple illustration, is capital punishment. Why is Cain not put to death for murdering Abel? You know why, Brother Brian? It wasn't dispensed yet. Capital punishment does not get dispensed until Noah gets off the ark in Genesis chapter 9. At that time, God dispenses that truth to Noah, and now capital punishment is in effect. And guess what? That truth dispensed to Noah in Genesis 9 carries through the law, carries through the church age, and I believe it carries throughout all eternity. If you kill an innocent man, then your blood must be shed. But that is not dispensed until Genesis chapter nine. So that's what a dispensation is. That's what uh, God dispensing truth is. And, and again, that just hopefully helps simplify. And some that. of those go and then come back. They disappear, right. they reappear. Right, absolutely. Like millennial temple, the Sabbath, Colossians two, it's a shadow of things to come. Absolutely. The Sabbath reoccurs. The Passover reoccurs in the millennium, yeah. which a lot of people don't know about and it's kind of hard to grasp sometimes, but yeah. there's, I think the hundreds of verses on it, you can't get rid of it. In the millennium, there's yeah. a temple. They're observing all kinds of things under the law. So Christ didn't do away with all that stuff, right. but the church, he did. That's why it's so exactly. important to get the uniqueness and how we're so special and di different. This stuff comes back. If Jesus Christ did away with all that, why is it coming back in the millennium? And I think personally, and this will be an interesting discussion in the future too, the millennium is really the unfolding of all those dispensations because you see them all coming back. You got the church there, you got the law there, you got sacrifices there. I mean, you got it's the unfolding of, of what God had laid out from the beginning, and they're kind of all just coming to pass in the millennium. So, interesting subject in itself. Do we have other things we want to cover in regards to this tribulation overview? It's, so go. You yeah. can edit it. Or, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. I okay. can cut it anyways. Uh, all right, go. This one we're going to turn to, just some, I have, what do I have? Oh, I have 18 points on why we believe in dispensationalism, why salvation is not the same, why Brother Stauffer and the looking forward to the cross, Fundy crowd is wrong, but there's a verse here, number 10, Revelation 21, verse 24, which we kind of touched on, I'll just read that. And the nations, this is in the, this is after the millennium, right. Revelation 20, white throne judgment, they're standing there, God destroys the heaven and the earth by fire, he creates a new heaven, new earth, Revelation 21. We're into eternity. And the nations, sounds like Matthew 25, judgment of nations, the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. That's New Jerusalem. That's where the church is. That's the bride of Christ. There's a new heaven, new, earth, new heaven for the Gentiles, new earth for the Jew. And then we're in New Jerusalem. It's a city that 1,400 by 1,400 furlongs or 1,200, whatever it is. And that's where we live. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth, this is not the church. This is someone separate from the body of Christ do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter, enter into it anything that defileth, 
neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the land's book of life. How do you enter this city? Revelation 22, 14, which John R. Rice even said, that's a mistranslation. The King James translators were Episcopal baby sprinklers, so they just didn't understand it. It should say this. Well, Brother Stauffer can't do that. Brother Knox can't, you know, can't do right. that. They're Bible believers. They're Bible believers. It means what it says. Revelation 22, 14. How are you going to put this on the bride of Christ? Blessed are they that do his commandments, plural. What do they get for the commandments? You are an absolute, I won't call this brother a heretic, but you are an absolute heretic if you're going to put this on the body of Christ. Right. That they may have right to the tree of life. I don't need a tree of That's life. That's right. We have Jesus Christ. And what? What happens when they eat the tree of life? May enter in through the gates into the city. Who enters that city? We just read it. The nations of them which are saved. Is that the church? We are the city. Right. We're in the city. So shall we ever be with the Lord. We can't lose salvation. We can't get kicked out of the city. But there are people who obviously are not the church. They're not in the city. They're obviously not saved like us. They have to eat a tree of life, apparently to keep living, and then they get to enter a city. And then they, they leave and then enter it and leave it. Mm -hmm. That's obviously not the church, and it's obviously a different setup that they have to eat this tree of life. So I don't. That's one of my points on why salvation is different. Yeah. And, and it's an excellent point. And again, there's example after example you can go to to show that these things written in the Book of Revelation are not written no. to the church. And there's commandments. There's things they have to do to partake of the tree of life. Again, I don't need the tree of life. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. I have the son of God. I have life. I've passed from death unto life. I don't need to keep any commandments and I don't need to partake of the tree of life because I have Jesus Christ. But obviously that is not true for everyone in the future. And study that subject out more. Yeah. Well, all we're showing you is an example of how everything is not the same. I can just read through yeah, this yeah. really quickly yeah. here, and we'll be done with that. All right, law. Here's just how the Bible describes lawbreakers: email us, text us, whatever. As far as getting the verse, I got all the verses, but lawbreakers are described as cursed. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of law to do them. Died without mercy. That's Hebrews ten twenty eight. Lost their righteousness. Brother, Ch Pastor Chad read that in Ezekiel. They die in their sins, Ephesians 2, you have the quicken who were dead mm -hmm. in sin, so that doesn't sound good. <laughs> right. Their sins are not forgiven. They miss the rapture. They miss the kingdom, Matthew 25. Salvation is far, that's a great verse, Psalm 119, verse 155. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they keep not thy statutes. Mm -hmm. Kind of sounds not only not salvation, church aid, exact opposite. Right. I would never say it to anybody. I'd be a heretic if I did. You're not going, you're not saved because you don't keep God's law. All right, their names are blotted out from under heaven. Wow. I think Moses said yeah, that. Yeah, he did. Deuteronomy 29, something like that. Mm -hmm. And they burn in hell forever. That's Matthew 25. Depart from me, yep. curse of why? Because I didn't take care of the Jew. Another point, salvation and other dispensations. These last three are kind of what, what he's getting wrong. It's not um, It's not a one-time event, right. like the new birth. Right. Therefore, no one really loses it. That's it. It's not a transaction free gift to God that you do one time. So you can't try to act like that's what's going on in the Old Testament. Then I just have about Christ's blood is necessary sure. and grace is necessary for all. And I have those verses on there. Absolutely. I don't know if you want to look at those. Oh, we, we'll, we'll pass on those for now. Okay. But but again, we we did say that we believe without a shadow of doubt, Christ's blood is yeah. necessary for everyone in every dispensation Amen. for salvation. Nobody's but this good is enough. that's right. Know. Nobody's good enough, and their works won't get be good enough to get no. them to heaven. John fourteen six. Again, this is why I, we believe the Bible clearly teaches that nobody was saved in the Old Testament. Well, this is why we believe that in, in the New Testament, that nobody is saved, born again, spiritually circumcised, sealed unto the day of redemption in the tribulation. They do not have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ like you and I do. They are not born again in a moment when they call upon the Lord to save them. And uh, interesting, you know, you look at that um, quote there in Romans chapter 10, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that's a cross-reference to Joel yeah. chapter two, the difference is Romans 10 says, says shall be saved. Joel says delivered. Isn't that interesting? One is saved, you and I praise the Lord, and the other is delivered. Joel tribulation. Or yeah, yeah, second heaven, right? yeah. So again, the point is it's not the same. Um, so those are clear distinctions we wanna make in the tribulation overview. 
You're either wicked or righteous in the Old Testament. Under our dispensation, after the cross of Calvary, all the way up to the time of the rapture, one must receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And at that moment, he is born again. He is sealed on the day of redemption. He has the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. The next major event is going to be the rapture of the church. That's going to kick off the period called Daniel's 70th week. Now, I'm sure we've referred to it multiple times as the tribulation period because that's what it's commonly called. I, I think most people realize when we say tribulation, what we're referring to, we're referring to Daniel's 70th week. Uh, so those are some major overviews. Any any last thoughts, Brother Ryan, you want to hit in regards to major overviews of tribulation and salvation or in general? Yeah, I have one verse that really sums it up. Two verses. Romans 10, we already read it. Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth them shall live them. Look at these cross references how Paul does it. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, and he's going to quote Deuteronomy 30, and applied to church age. Mm. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. This is Deuteronomy 30, which we'll go to in a second. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart, what is this word, Paul, hmm. that if thou, that is the word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and he, for whosoever shall call on him, Lord, shall be yeah. saved. Paul quotes Deuteronomy 30 and applies it to New Testament mm. gospel salvation. Let's see what the original says. <laughs> Deuteronomy 30, 11, And it's, it's amazing. For this commandment, this is Moses, which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. But, w but the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart. Sounds really familiar, yeah, right? right? And then Moses says, if thou shalt believe in Jehovah and confess with thy mouth, you'll be saved. No, that thou mayest do it. Mm. Wow. You want to know what Old Testament salvation, tribulation salvation, millennial salvation is? That thou mayest do it. Mm. Paul quotes it and he leaves off do it because that's heresy today. Right. It was not heresy back then. It was God's word back then. It says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart, God hath raised him, thou shalt be saved. Black and white contrast. That's right. You know what Jesus Christ said on the cross? It is finished. That's right. Salvation is done today. Under the Old Testament, it was do this and do that, right. and do this, and do that. And of course in need of the blood of Jesus Christ or none of them would have made it. I can't take my next breath without the blood of That's Jesus it, Christ, man. without God's mercy and grace. There's not a man out of eight billion on earth today that can breathe without God's mercy or grace. So of course in the Old Testament, they had to have God's mercy, right. they had to have God's grace, and no one Old Testament, New Testament gets to, gets to heaven, gets saved without the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's half his book is... Well, if they were good enough, they can get to heaven by all on their own and say, I did it, Jesus, I didn't need you. No, we don't believe that. <laughs> right. Of course they needed God's grace. They needed God's mercy, and they needed the blood of Jesus Christ. But it wasn't that alone like it is today because we are special. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We got these wonderful promises. But yeah, that's it. <laughs> And I think, uh, you know, in conclusion, our tribulation salvation overview and just kind of dispensational in general and Old Testament salvation in general, we dove into a lot of this stuff because we want to lay the foundation to really do a good review of this subject. And, and obviously this first podcast may just mostly be our overview, uh, but we, we strongly encourage you to tune in to the next couple of podcasts where we will uh, dive in and dissect uh, more of the specifics that are raised in the book, uh, Tribulation and Salvation by Pastor Doug Stoffer. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but you raised some good points there in your closing statements about, you know, the compare and contrast, the Old Testament. And, you know, you made the statement, of course, we need grace and mercy. And one of those yes. straw men arguments yes. is, again, is, well, you think there's no grace. We've never said that. I don't know a single no. Bible believer nope. that teaches there's no grace in the Old Testament. Yes. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. But again, this has to do with the difference between words. Like there's different types of righteousness. You have the personal righteousness versus the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There is also a different type of grace. Now we understand what grace is. But the Bible says the law came by Moses and grace and truth. Uh, by who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Well, what grace came by Jesus Christ? They're the same though, brother. Right? That's the, if you want to make everything the same. But I think Paul tells us what grace came by Jesus Christ in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace are ye Amen. saved. 
Listen, the saving grace came by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we have salvation. Again, I can't reiterate it enough. That's why they did not have salvation yes. in the Old Testament. But that doesn't change the fact that they still had the grace of God. Everyone needs the grace of God. Yeah. Everyone needs the mercy of God. Yes. So when people raise those arguments up, they're simply straw man arguments, yeah. and they don't address verses like you cover today about doing. One last thought, and that's why Paul talks about the just shall live by faith. As we both know, that's a quote from Habakkuk, where it says what? The just shall live by his faith. By his faith. Paul does not use that word his because we know one of the amazing things that we received in Christ is we live by the faith of Christ. Now, with that said, we'll wrap up this broadcast. And again, we hope you tune in to the next week and maybe next two weeks where we're going to dive into the book, Tribulation Salvation. And I hope you've enjoyed this time. We've enjoyed it. We're excited. Uh, we do We do. maybe get on some fits and rambling, uh, but we hope that you've at least considered these things that we've said in regards to Old Testament salvation, regards to tribulation salvation. And uh, most of all, I pray that you are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, until next time, we thank you for joining our The Word of a King podcast. Again, Brother Brian, it's a blessing. Looking forward to what God has for us. Amen. Me too. Amen. Almost forgot that we are going to give a book away today. So what we're going to do is, Brother Brian, you're going to come up with a Bible question. I should have told you before. Yeah. Start thinking. Start thinking of a Bible question. <laughs> and the first one to respond to the correct answer. I'm giving Brother Brian a minute to think. The first one to respond to the correct answer on Facebook. When this goes live, we will send you a copy of Kyle Stevens, excuse me, trying to get over there. Kyle Stevens' new book, Building Thereupon. Now, this is not a cheap book. This is a pretty expensive book. And But beyond the price of it, it's a wonderful book on how to build Bible doctrine. So we're going to give this away as a gift from us here at the Word of a King podcast to you. And again, we will announce by a message when this will post live on Facebook. Myself, I'll be on there. Maybe Brother Brian too. So it'll be a syndicated live video. And the first one to type in the correct answer to Brother Brian's Bible question will win this book. So, Brother Brian, what is the Bible question to win Kyle Stevens' book, Building Thereupon? Okay, for years I asked this question, one of my favorite Bible questions. And it was the only book in the Bible, but before I give the question, I just realized months ago, recently... I've been saying this Bible question for years and realized it was wrong the whole time. Uh-oh. This is not only one. There are two books in the Bible. So name one of the two books in the Bible that ends with a question mark. Ooh, that's a good There's question. two of them. For years, up until months ago, I said the only book in the Bible. And I think because I've heard other people say it. And then this other, the two books are kind of, they kind of go together, even though they're not a first and a second. But yeah, name one of the two books that end with a question mark. So I think, uh, Brother Ryan, because we do this often at Lighthouse, and uh, you asked this question during one of our quizzes, and so I'm going to put a little exclusion on those who've already participated in Brother Ryan's question. So you can't be one of the first ones to answer because you already know the answer to it. So, yeah, you did. So now, again, uh, this is not excluding all of Lighthouse members, this is just excluding if you were ever part of Brian's quiz during our fellowships <laughs> and he asked you this question already. Um, so I know I was there at least once when this question was asked. So again, everyone else, whoever types in on Facebook, on my page, let me clarify, on my page, where this will be shared, syndicated live, the correct answer you will win that book and we'll send it to you for free. Again, thank you for watching the Word of a King podcast. Until next time, we pray for you and pray that uh, you would get in the book and love the Lord Jesus Christ. The key to understand the Word of God is for the author to show you what the things are. If you understand that book, you get for the author. Then he opened their understanding.